Well, welcome. In this video lecture, we are looking at the book Think Python, How to Think Like a Computer Scientist. We're looking at the second edition. The authors are Alan, Jeffrey, and Chris. I'm going to be doing video lectures. My name is Arthur Solomon. I'm going to be working with you throughout these videos. Thank you. Chapter 1, The Way of the Program. The main objectives today are an overview of computer program fundamentals, describing the basic features of an algorithm, explain how hardware and software collaborate in computer architecture, give a brief overview of computing, and compose and run a simple Python program. So first and foremost, what is a program? A program is a sequence of instructions that are specified on how to perform a computational function. While the details may look different in different languages, there are a few basic uh, components that almost every program have. There is an input, there is some form of conditional execution or math portion, calculation portion, and then there is output. The input is the ability to get data from the keyboard, a file, a network, or other source of in, uh, incoming uh, data. The math portion is going to be some type of basic mathematical operation like addition or multiplication or possibly a conditional execution that may be looking for certain conditions. The computational component could be any form that does something to input that will translate it from our input into our output. Our output would be the, the display of the output or data on the screen possibly saving it to a file or sending it over the network or printing out a physical copy. Again, a simple program has these three main components, input, condition, uh, conditions, or math, and some type of process to outputs. All right, so running Python, there is some barriers to getting Python to work, and the biggest one is getting it installed. First of all, there's multiple versions, version two versus version three versus the subversions and whatnot, we are going to be working with the in desktop installed version of version 3. We're going to be taking Python and we're going to be crafting our code. Python itself is an interpreter. An interpreter is a program that will read and execute the Python code. Depending on our environment, you may start with an interpreter by clicking on an icon or by typing Python on a command line or other way. We are going to be setting Python as a desktop install in Windows, so we'll have an icon that we can click on that will load our Python. So we know we can begin when we see our three carrots. That's when we know we can enter code. All right, so I have a Windows 10 machine. I'm gonna be showing you in the next video how to set up our Windows machine to get Python to function. Here we have our IDEL uh, Python. I'm gonna go ahead and more I want to uh, you know for now we're just gonna get it to start it's going to open it's gonna be the version it's gonna be tagged it's gonna be today's date more importantly it's gonna give us some um, uh, functions help copyright credits and licensing and then we see our three carrots from those three uh, those three carrots we know that we can start coding so let's go ahead and let's do our first simple program. So we're gonna be doing print hello. And there's two ways of doing it. The version one is print parentheses, single quote, hello, single quote, in parentheses. In Python 2, however, it's slightly different. You can do print without the parentheses because normally parentheses call a function and in version two, we weren't using it as a function, where in version three, we actually are. So we have a few different ways to do this. All right, so in our lab environment, let's go ahead and let's do version one. So we'll do print parentheses, single quote, hello, single quote, hit enter. It will execute and display. Let's go and do version two. So print, single quote, hello, single quote. 
first thing that I did was I did single quote and it put them to double quotes and it gave me a syntax error. Just to make sure I didn't fat finger it. Single quote, same type of syntax error. So that's kind of what we were expecting. So what we're gonna be doing in our course is we're gonna be using our parentheses when we are doing our basic display for our characters. So what else can we do? We have arithmetic uh, operations, and that's essentially, we need to understand the order of operations. In basic math, you learn P-E-M-D-A-S. Parentheses, exponents, multiplication, division, addition, and subtraction. So, in Python, we have the same functions. If we want parentheses, we use parentheses. If we want exponents, we're gonna use two stars. If we want basic multiplication, it's gonna be a single star. If we want division, it will be uh, slash, if we want addition, it's the add sign, if we want subtraction, it will be a minus sign. We are not covering bitwise, also known as XOR, also known as our top carrots. That's outside the scope of today's lecture. So let's go ahead and let's do some basic print. Two plus two. If we do print with our parentheses, two plus two, it provides us an answer. If we just do two plus two, it also prints. So some of the different types of values do not actually need the print function in order for to have them printed. Uh, three times two, two divided by four divided by two. Again, understanding the order of operations, so we can't do 2 divided by 4 and expect it to give us 2. 2 divided by 4 should provide us with, you know, half. So understanding how we do our parentheses or how we do that order of operations really does matter. How we do our parentheses also is important. 1 plus 2 divided by 2. So Parentheses first, then our multiplication, or here we're doing division. So if we do the same thing, parentheses one plus two times two, parentheses like normal math, it does matter, so do keep that in mind. Also notice our different types. So here we have a word, hello. Here we have a number. Here we have some decimal places. What are those? So what's interesting is we have different types of values and types. We have an integer, that's a whole number. We have a floating point, that is typically a decimal value. Uh, that is a specific decimal place. We have a complex number, and those are typically a real number plus an imaginary number or an imaginary part. We have strings. We have different types of strings, like a, an escape a sequence, a raw string, a triple quoted. Those we're going to cover in more detail a little bit later, but the importance is we know that we have strings. And strings are sequences of character data, and the string type in Python is called str. We can have a character be a string, the number two, or we could have a character be a number, number two. If it is a number, we can treat it as a value, the value number two. If we have it as a printed character of two, that is not the same thing. And lastly, we have a Boolean uh, type. And this is more focusing on truthness. And Booleans typically have one or two values. It's either true or false. Lastly, inside of Python, there are a ton of built-in functions and features that we're going to be exploring. So some of our built-in data types, text, are going to be strings. If we're talking numbers, we have ints, we have floats, we have complex. Sequencing, we have lists and ranges, and so forth. So this is just a way for us to start distinguishing when we type str, 
that that really is code for string. So one of the things that I was asked, so moving on, we have our formal versus natural language. Natural language is people, or the language that people speak. Formal language are languages that are designed by people for specific applications. So uh, natural language like English, French, German, uh, Spanish, that's things that we can actually learn and uh, go through. They were not designed by people, they were just evolved. They evolved naturally. While formal language, these are languages that are designed. This uh, is, for example, the notion that math uh, mathematicians use a formal language is particularly good to denote at relationships among numbers and symbols. They, mathematicians, were able to define the language that they use for that profession. Those are typically called jargon. When we are dealing with computer scientists, or we're dealing with application, or we're dealing with computers, or dealing with uh, digital systems, the program or the programming languages are the formal languages that have been designed to express computational or digital values. Big part of that is understanding that language has a very specific structure. Typically, we are looking at structure as tokens and the overall structure. Syntax is the overall rules that we're going to be following. So there are two rules when it comes uh, to picking out a language, and that pertains to both tokens and structure. Tokens are the basic elements of the language, such as the words, the numbers, the chemical elements, and so forth. Well, sometimes it's not always legal uh, to type in certain responses. For example, three plus nothing equals three dollar sign six. While they may all be relative characters, that sequence doesn't actually mean anything. The dollar sign is not really a legal token for mathematics. So it kind of defeats the purpose, the, the overall structure. The second type of syntax rule pertains to the way tokens are combined. For example, the equation 3 plus blank equals 3 is illegal even though the addition sign and the equal signs are legal tokens. You cannot have one right after another. They actually have to have a very specific structure. At the bottom of this page, you will see this is a, or this is at, well-structured English sentence with invalid tokens in it. This sentence all valid tokens has, but invalid structure with. So here's an example of bad tokens and bad structure. Structure is again the overall structure of what we are doing. The tokens are invalid symbols. So there are some differences between language. Although formal and natural languages have many features in common, tokens and structure and syntax, there are a lot of differences. For example, ambigu uh, ambiguity. This is where the natural languages are full of ambiguity uh, terms. People deal with and express and use contextually clues and other information, where with formal language, it's not designed to be nearly as completely unambiguous which means there are statements that exactly one meaning, regardless of context. The sky is blue. The number one equals one. Those are factual portions where there is no interpretation, there is no ambiguity. It is the value of something is fact. Redundancy is another way. Redundancy is in order to make up for ambiguity, and reduce misunderstandings, natural languages employ lots of redundancies. As a result, they are often very verbose. While well, formal languages are less redundant and more concise, more direct. In our natural language, we have literalness. This is where the natural languages are full of idioms and metaphors. For example, if I say the penny dropped, there is probably no penny 
and nothing is actually dropping. It's not as literal, but with formal language, it is very literal. Because we all grew up speaking natural language, it's sometimes hard to adjust to formal languages. So we are going to be looking at the differences between formal and natural languages, like the difference between poetry and prose. But more so, poetry, this is the word, are used for their sounds as well as their meaning, and the whole poem together creates the effect for the emotional response. Ambiguity is not only a common, but often deliberate. Prose is the literal meaning of words and a more important and structured contribution, more specific in its meaning. Pose is more amenable to analysis than poetry. Because again, poetry brings in ambiguity. Programs. This is the meaning of a computer program is ambiguous and literal and can be understood entirely by the analysis of the token and the structure. One of the last sections in this chapter is about debugging. And keep in mind, programmers make mistakes. Everyone makes mistakes. For this reason, programming errors are often called bugs. And the process of tracking down to those bugs is called debugging. We have several keywords in our glossary, things like high-level language and interpreter and prompts and programs, uh, print statements, operators, values, types, and more. We have two exercises at the end of this module. Keep in mind that exercise 1.1, it is a good idea to read the book in front of the computer so we can carry out the examples as we go, like we've done in this video. Exercise 1.2 basically is to start the Python interpreter and use it as a calculator to perform some functions. That concludes this chapter. If you have any questions or concerns, please feel free to reach out and leave me a comment or a question. I'll try to get those answered as quickly as I can. Again, thank you and I look forward to working with you in later modules.